Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we are here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. We're so glad you joined us. My name is J. Darren Gross. I am a commercial insurance broker and a real estate investor. And a long time ago, I recognized the importance of learning all the ins and outs, ups and downs of real estate in order to better help my clients. And Commercial Real Estate Pro Network and CREPN Radio uh, is my effort to have and share a conversation with experts on topics of interest to investors and professionals dealing in commercial real estate. The goal of these, <clears throat> excuse me, the goal of, of all of this uh, is to help, again, my clients, uh, prospective customers, and, and um, uh, others that work in commercial real estate uh, better better understand and know how to, to operate in commercial real estate. So that's our goal. You can find us uh, by Googling Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. Uh, you'll find us. We've got a Facebook page. We've got a YouTube page. We've got a LinkedIn group. And also our Twitter handle <clears throat> is at CRE Pro Network, P-R-O-N-E-T-W-O-R-K. And coming soon, we're going to have a, a website. Uh, we're going old school. We're going to have commercialrealestatepronetwork.com. Now, how you can help is if you like what we're doing, if you like what the uh, guests are saying, if you like what you see uh, posted on any of our, our other uh, outlets, you can do what, what, the, uh, what you do on social media. Like, share, comment. <clears throat> let, let us know that you're liking what we're doing. Share it with your network, share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your work colleagues. So now that you know what we're doing and what we're about, it's time to set up today's program. And uh, what we are looking at today is a little asset protection. And uh, for most of our listeners, we either, or most of our listeners either own real estate or are considering purchasing investment real estate. And the reasons are numerous, uh, but probably mostly uh, that's uh, in an effort to accumulate wealth and provide for your family and a more secure future for your family. So while many of us have started with nothing and had nothing at all to risk, uh, if we stay with it for any, any amount of time, and it doesn't take very long, possibly 10 years, you can have a whole new problem that comes along, and that's the, the problem of abundance. And when you have that problem, you need some new tools. How are you going to keep uh, your your wealth, your assets, uh, and avoid any silly unwanted risk? So today we're going to take a look at asset protection planning. And to do that, we are fortunate to have our guest, Harry Barth. Harry is the founding member and senior partner of the firm Barth Cauldron, LLP. Uh, Harry has been has more than 40 years of experience cons <clears throat> excuse me, counseling franchises, property owners, business owners, corporations, individuals, and families. Uh, he's distinguished himself by being an asset protection advocate, and he's co-authored a book titled Planning Today for All Your Tomorrows, a Practical Guide to Help High Income and or High Net Worth Clients. Harry, are you there? One Harry? moment, let me connect. I'm sorry, let me connect him. Oh. One moment. Oh, perfect, perfect. <clears throat> well, we're waiting for Harry. I'll tell you a little bit more about his uh, background here. Harry is an attorney. He also has his MBA. He's got a master's in science in financial services. He's a certified asset protection planner, certified wealth preservation planner. Uh, he's got his uh, chartered financial consultant, uh, also a chartered life underwriter. Harry, is that you? I'm here. Harry, Darren, How nice are you, Darren? to uh, hear your voice. I'm great. Good to hear you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. 
I was just uh, telling the audience a little bit about uh, some of your background, but uh, I was hoping you might be able to uh, fill in some of the gaps and tell us a little bit about how you got started and uh, what led your your uh, focus to asset protection as your uh, uh, your practice. Okay, well, uh, we've actually uh, I've been at this uh, for 45 years, and a little bit about uh, about my background. I have uh, hold a couple of master's degrees, a doctorate degree in law, and uh, I'm the managing, founding, and senior member of Barth Calderon. Um, and and a firm uh, has a practice focus or concentration area on asset protection, estate planning, and business organizations uh, with a high concentration in asset protection. Now, what led uh, my focus there is very, very interesting. You know, you know when you're doing estate planning, uh, we're basically saying that if, if someone dies, that we want to keep creditors out of the estate. Uh, we want to reduce the burden uh, of taxation. In essence, we are engaging. Uh, we want to make it simple. We want to keep it. We're engaging in asset protection in the uh, in the event of, uh, of death. But as we both know, uh, especially over the last 15, 20 years, uh, the, the the litigation explosion uh, in the United States is uh, pretty much uh, been out of control. Matter of fact, there are 95% of uh, all litigation in the world occurs in the uh, good old uh, U.S. of A., and uh, only 5% outside of the good old U.S. of A. And, and, I, and I've, uh, the opinion just from experience and practice, and, uh, and I've been a long time in practice, uh, I believe that the there's just not a uh, an equitable system um, in in our country. Seems it used to be, you know, he who had the, the gold rules, if you remember that. Now, of course, that he who has the gold pays. So, uh, you know, and what used to be rule of law has become rule of lawyers, and uh, I, we can do, and probably will as we go through our time together, give uh, numerous of examples of uh, of how. Uh, what was once uh, hopefully a system to adjudicate disputes has now become a legal lottery uh, for uh, people to uh, basically uh, go after people that have that seemingly have uh, a, a great deal of assets or have assets uh, that make them a target. So I think that uh, that's that's kind of um, impassioned me uh, and our firm to to work in that area. Um, and um, we've had uh, numerous, numerous examples over the years of how people who have engaged in proper uh, asset protection planning have been able to um, achieve uh, what I think would be a, a proper uh, result uh, rather than one that could be overly zealous or predatory. Got it. Well, thank you for giving us a little background there and, and – um... Like you mentioned, uh, there's been a little bit of an evolution uh, oh, yeah. just in in the uh, uh, the climate, legal climate, with uh, people suing and and uh, probably more more directly to that than the need for uh, proper asset uh, protection. And um, maybe a good place to start is just kind of how, how do you how do you define what is asset protection planning uh, well, when you're working with a client. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, I think that, it's, that asset protection really, we will define it by what it is, but we'll also define it first by what it is not. Asset protection is not attempting to go out and screw your creditors. Asset protection is not a means of hiding and secreting assets. Asset protection is not a mean for means for not paying taxes. Um, what asset protection is is a process of employing, uh, let's say, legally acceptable concepts and strategies to ensure that a person's wealth is uh, not uh, unjustly taken. And it's done by, first of all, making sure that everybody has proper insurance. Uh, I think that that's critical. So a plaintiff can be driven to the insurance and one's uh, personal and business assets uh, should uh, be not touched or, or make it more difficult. And so we also create structures that make assets more difficult to reach, speed bumps in the road, and in some cases, highly protective. And the more barriers there are between assets and liabilities, the greater the leverage uh, to negotiate a just, favorable settlement with creditors. Uh, God forbid we, uh, we happen to be subject to the vagaries of our, our, our current legal system. 
So asset protection is it, it's a game plan by which we organize our assets in such a way that uh, they're the most protective for us. Uh, God forbid we, we should have a problem. But I think it's really important. Uh, there's a cornerstone or a keystone concept um, that's uh, really important. With, let's say three keystone concepts that are very important about asset protection planning. And, and, and one of them, uh, Darren, is, is, is very, very simple that you don't engage in asset protection planning uh, when it's too late. Uh, we see this all the time. We have people, you know, something happens after the fact. We wouldn't call you, Darren, in the insurance business and say, my house is on fire. I don't have adequate fire insurance. Or uh, yeah. we've just had a horrible automobile wreck. And there are injuries or perhaps a death, and we're not so sure we have appropriate uh, liability insurance. We want to increase that. So uh, I think it's really important to understand that quality asset protection planning uh, needs to be done way before uh, there is an event when there are no uh, storm clouds in the sky. I think that's critical. We have people that they get desperate. We call them hair on fire. They've had a problem. They had a wreck. They had perhaps some alcohol involved and some serious injuries. And next thing you know, well, what can we do? People have gotten to the point, Darren, I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, what happens if my wife and I, what if we get divorced? Uh, what if I give everything to my kids and put it in trust for my kids? People become desperate when they believe that they could possibly lose everything they've worked all their life for. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that as a protection planning uh, has to be done uh, at an appropriate and, uh, and proper time. The other thing, too, um, that I think is really important, and again, I don't know where this comes from, but um, you know, a lot of people think they're the living revocable trust, you know, the trust that we use for uh, estate planning, uh, you know, so we could write a great constitution for the kids and between husband and wife or between parents, children, and or grandchildren. Uh, that living revocable trust is there for probate avoidance, privacy purposes, and perhaps a little bit of uh, tax savings. But it's not there as an asset protection vehicle. And so many people who may be listening to this might turn around and say, well, I have my house in my trust or I have my bank accounts in my trust. It's protected, isn't it? And I guess the the answer to that is if you can reach the assets, uh, a creditor can reach the assets as well. So that's another misnomer. And then, of course, the last but not least uh, one uh, is that, you know, I have insurance for that. I have umbrella insurance. I have umbrellas on top of umbrellas on top of umbrellas. And so, therefore, I bought all this insurance, uh, which hopefully will transfer that risk to the third-party insurer. And, and, and I think that insurance is um, a, a critical, an absolutely critical component of asset protection planning is that it is a place to drive a plaintiff to uh, if we are negligent or have problems. But there are issues that are involved there. You know, it's the old story. You may have had a, a client that has a, a couple million dollar umbrella policy and they got a judgment for three and a half million. Where's the other million and a half from, come from? So it's not unlikely that we, one can get a judgment that's in excess of the liability insurance that they have. It's also possible um, that, uh, or sometimes probable, that the type of claim that's being presented uh, uh, to the carrier is not the type of claim that's specifically covered. So, for example, special damages, exemplary damages, and punitive damage are pretty much excluded from uh, most uh, liability policies. So, if it's contractual liability, there's all different kinds of liability. And, and one of the things that uh, the problems that uh, I think the general public faces is that they've seen those commercials where, you know, guys walking around with maybe a red umbrella or something and, and everything that falls out of the sky that hits the umbrella falls off. And I think that people believe that when they have umbrella coverage that everything that could happen to them is covered. Well, we all know it's just the stated causes of action uh, are covered under those particular contracts and uh, not everything uh, is covered. And we, I'm sure you know uh, as well, you've seen uh, the following things where an insurance company will write a letter uh, uh, to um, to their client, one known as a reservation of rights, where they say, oh, by the way, we'll defend you, but if you're found liable for this particular risk, you're not covered. Or the other famous one that we get is, well, it appears that the claim that you have will be in excess of the coverage that you have. Please contact your lawyer. It's a little bit late in the game in order to do that. So I think that that's what asset protection is, what asset protection is not, and some of the conditions that that, that are involved today um, uh, with asset protection. 
No, I think that uh, that's that's well said and and very helpful. Uh, you know, these scenarios, as you're pointing out on the insurance thing, I've had all those calls. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, after the after the event, people are trying to buy coverage or thinking they can go backwards or wondering if they could if they if they would have bought it uh, prior or you know, can we back the oh, sure coverage? sure. Sure, and we ought to expand that for a sec to, just to to to, know, to understand the risks that we face. You know, we have uh, people have, as, as you know, liabilities for acts of business partners and employees, employment related stuff, and if they don't have employer practices liability insurance, uh, they may not be covered. Uh, there's divorce, which is a so your spouse becomes a creditor. We have personal guarantees when we we buy things. You know, we buy a commercial building, and we need a personal guarantee. We have taxes. Uh, we have professional malpractice for those of us that are in the insurance business and doctors, lawyers. Uh, we have rental property, which we'll talk about, accidents that occur, sexual harassment violations, auto accidents, homeowners accidents, acts of family members, kids driving cars, people who use our, our, our vehicles, medical bills, deficiency judgments. I mean, we need to know that creditor, but it doesn't necessarily come from the traditional sources of, you know, just I crashed my car, I don't have enough insurance. It could come from so many uh, different directions. Uh, you can have joint and several liability as an owner of a business. It's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you, you kind of touched on a little bit and I've had a little bit of experience with this and it's, it's, um, it's scary and it happens. Uh, the, the situation where you don't have enough limits and, uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, where are they going to get the other limits? And they start looking to see what else you've got sure. and, uh, the liquidation kind of thing that can go on. It's, um, it definitely is something that does not need to happen, uh, but it but it happens all the time. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. It's not something that everybody so, thinks about every day, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think uh, maybe a, a, a next step then would be just talking about the the who uh, you know needs needs asset protection uh, planning, and and I say that because I think w- one of the things I run into a lot is you get. Uh, an entrepreneur that starts out with nothing. Basically, they've got a a plan, they've got a dream, they've got some uh, umption, and they go out and they set about working, and and uh, they work hard. They work harder than most, and uh, they're they're typically the ones that are uh, more willing to take on as much risk as they they can because they also know that they don't have anything to lose. But what happens over not very many years is all of a sudden their picture changes dramatically and that balance sheet starts to have some zeros on it. And uh, one of the things I've seen is how the mindset continues to be the same as that guy that just started out with nothing. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the people that need it? Cause I, I think there is a, in, in, in many people's eyes, there's a perception of, uh, you know that's result reserved or asset planning protection is something reserved for uh, the ultra rich or somebody that's uh, sure. much further. You know, away so from actually, me. that's yeah, that's actually quite a, a, a common perception, and you know, it, it, and it's and it's actually really, really, really inaccurate. I mean, we take a, a simple situation of uh, someone starting that business, Darren, and they're a sole proprietor. And so at some point along the way, sometimes for tax purposes, sometimes for asset protection purposes, the CPA or local council will recommend perhaps that they incorporate. And we all know that one of the reasons that people may incorporate is to draw a line of demarcation between their personal assets and their business assets. So if there's a business liability, uh, hopefully they won't lose their home. So people are engaging in, you know, in asset protection planning. And it, it, it's funny because uh, you don't need to have to be ultra rich to engage in asset protection planning. And, and, and give me some examples of that. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick, um, you know, uh, that business owner who uh, once upon a time had nothing and now they've uh, built their business a little bit and, now, uh, two different things can occur. One, the, the and this is a very interesting one to talk about with a business. So let's say they've incorporated a business, and that business is beginning to uh, have assets. So inside the business, we might have some equipment now, 
and we might have some intellectual property, you know, trademarks, uh, patents, copyrights. Uh, the business might have um, cash, uh, various different assets. And all of a sudden we have, what people don't realize, two forms of liability, just the business alone. One is what we call inside out, and the other is what we call outside in. And what's interesting is that more businesses are lost to an outside in liability than inside out, yet inside out is the one that's thought about quite a bit. And let me do it by means of an example. So let's say, Darren, you and I own a business, and it's a corporation. Uh, it could be an S corporation, and we incorporate it oh, in the state of uh, Texas. It doesn't matter, Missouri, Michigan. Uh, and the liability that we face didn't come as a result of the operation of our business. The, uh, the liability came because, Darren, you crashed the car and you killed a couple of people or somebody fell off the roof at your house and you're being sued personally. And so most small business owners or medium-sized business owners, the vast majority of their net worth is in the business. And as a result of owning the stock in that business, if I get a judgment against you, Darren, one of the things I'll see is, well, you might have a million and a half dollars in value or $2 million, the value of the business, if not more. I can get, as a creditor, I can get the stock of your business. So I don't care if it's Ford stock, Xerox stock, GM stock. If I get the stock of your business, I get control. I can liquidate your business. I could take your bank accounts. I could sell it to a competitor. You know, it's no, or I can continue to try to operate your business. Your business was lost. A lot of people don't realize this. Well, I'm incorporated. Well, the incorporation is really designed to do one thing. If I have a liability in the business, so if little Sally or Sam uh, crash their car while out at lunch picking up a pizza for Jack's birthday, and now we sue the company. So ABC Inc. gets sued. All of the assets that we spoke about earlier, the intellectual property, the equipment, everything inside the business is subject to that claim. But if the business is run properly, and of course there's a whole issue on what it means to run properly, then mm -hmm. our, our house and our bank accounts and our other assets should not be subject to that claim. It should end at the value of the business. However, so that's an inside liability taking up the assets that are inside the business. So there's an opportunity for asset protection is how should we structure the assets inside the business? So if God forbid we have a calamity or structure the business or organizationally structure the business, we have a calamity inside that the business has the best opportunity to withstand that claim and settle it appropriately and properly uh, or for the insurance amounts that they have and not take down the business. On the other hand, we had the outside liability, which happened because, you know, your wife crashed the car, you crashed the car, your kid crashed the car, and now you're subject to losing your business and perhaps your home. I think it's really important to understand, Darren, if, if you and I were in a situation and I was coming after you as an attorney uh, because of, uh, of a problem, I, I would think that your negotiating position with me, the creditor, would be stronger if you knew you weren't going to lose your house and you weren't going to lose your business. How strong is your negotiating position going to be if you know you could lose your house and lose your business? So I think that asset protection planning is designed, once again, say, hey, look, you're not going to get the house. You're not going to get the business. So we have insurance. Take our insurance. We have adequate amounts of insurance, very important part of asset protection planning. And then we can settle, hopefully, for pennies on a dollar and make this nightmare, which none of us wanted, uh, perhaps uh, go away. So, and then, you know, I think that another component, I think that we talked about the business a little bit. That's an inside outside, but we have similar problems with real estate, for example. One of the uh, highest forms of liability is landlord-tenant liability. So, you know, you got a landlord and you got a tenant. And depending on the state that you live in, uh, some states are uh, a little bit more in favor of the landlord. Some are a little bit more in favor of the, the tenant. Uh, as far as a bias is concerned, uh, most of the big populous states are more in favor of the tenant. So uh, whether it be mold, whether it be carbon monoxide, whether it be a fire, whether it be a security breach, we sue the landlord. And how many people, Darren, uh, sadly, 
are you'll see them they'll they'll be incorporated in their business or a limited liability company in their business yet they'll have one or two pieces of rental property a single family home their old house or some rental property that they'll hold in their own name or in the name of their living revocable trust so when i have a landlord tenant liability they themselves are the landlord and it's this, it's the same the, the liability ends with their bankruptcy so I think one thing that everyone who might listen to this podcast should walk away with is here's here's a truism. Never, ever be in the business of rental real estate as a sole proprietorship. Um, I I think that we can say that pretty much universally and is applicable to just about every single uh, situation. By the same token, uh, other than the landlord-tenant liability, we have the same issue like we had with the business. So, for example... Again, someone crashes the car, they kill two people, God forbid, large judgment comes against them or a personal guarantee comes due. And now the question is, is here's this piece of real estate that may be worth have six or seven hundred thousand dollars of equity in it, which is in their own name. So then the creditor would be able to take that piece of real estate and uh, foreclose on that piece of real estate, foreclose on their lien, and take the six, seven hundred thousand dollars and use that to apply towards the creditor claim. Well, again, if properly structured, a creditor could be limited to a lien over distributions from that real estate and not be able to foreclose or take away that property. Again, uh, allowing uh, hopefully a better uh, settlement uh, on behalf of, um, of the person that had the problem rather than in favor of the plaintiff. So I think that uh, there, there are a couple of examples. And, and the other things that we need to know um, that I think are critical is that some things, uh, for example, uh, are federally protected uh, from an asset protection perspective. Some things are state protected from a perspective. And everybody should know what those protections are for the particular state that they live in. And let's just use that as an example. So if someone's a resident of Florida or a resident of Kansas, resident of Texas, the homestead exemption, the amount of equity that they can have in their home, is unlimited. So we can have a $2.5 million home in the state of Texas that's all paid off, and that home could never be lost uh, to a creditor claim. It's just it's an unlimited amount. There's some size limitations, but pretty much almost every property fits within those size limitations. Same thing in Florida, same thing in Kansas. In Nevada, for example, one can have a half million dollars of equity in the home to be exempt from the claims of creditors. In California, for example, the homestead exemption, if you're single, it's $75,000 of equity. If you're married or two people are occupying the property, $100,000 of equity. And if someone's over age 65 or the disabled person living in the house, it's $175,000 worth of equity. So in California, where a lot of people's great values are in their homes, if you have a married couple or a single person, and they have greater than seventy five dollars or $100,000 of equity, which many do, their home can be sold at a forced sale. You get a check for $100,000 and say goodbye to your house. That same thing would not have happened in a different state. So those are state-by-state state exemptions. Um, so I think that everybody – so when you talked about uh, ultra-rich, you know, I think protecting our homes uh, is very important, protecting our pension plans – is very important. Protecting our savings is very important. And, you know, people asked me one time, you know, do you have to have a lot of money? And I always use this story. And there was a guy who worked in Penn Station in New York, and he shined shoes. And he shined shoes on the same corner every single day uh, for 10, 12 hours a day for 20, 30 years. And he managed, uh, Darren, to accumulate about $150,000 and over a life's work. And that $150,000 got him a very, 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 very small uh, little tiny home in Queens, New York, uh, for that $150,000. And how important do you think that is to that person? Uh, you know, so one does not have to be ultra-rich. One just needs to you know, understand that we all work very hard for everything we do, and we should always make sure as best as we possibly can that our assets are at least organized in a fashion that they're least likely to be subject to a creditor claim and, of course, have appropriate and, uh, and proper insurance. Now, I, you know, I wanted to just back up a second there on the um, the outside-in claim. I think that uh, that point is one that uh, is easily looked past, 
And um, I mean, because I, I think that most business owners have some sort of a sense that, you know, they're they're operating a business, they're dealing with the public. There's a chance that somebody from the outside could sue them for something that happened in their their company. And and I think that uh, the employee driving to the post office or whatever that's that's probably top of the list as far as you know somebody in an automobile uh, kind of thing is one that everybody faces. But I just want to back up one second because that that whole thing about the outside in. So you've got your partner and your partner's child is involved in an automobile accident. And all of a sudden now your business is in jeopardy uh, mm-hmm. because of that, that activity. And I, I think that, I, I know the business owners I deal with, it's not it's not a regular uh, talked about, it's not, not understood by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so that's something that's, um, I, I love let the me picture you painted there too. Yeah, let me articulate yeah. it on that a little further because I think it bears uh, it bears uh, further conversation. So you, you, we all understand that there are two different um, uh, property systems in the United States. Actually, there's three, but two major ones: you know, common law and community property. And uh, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, community property for a moment. Um, and in a community property state, so Darren, you and I uh, are a, um, a corporation. We call it uh, Darren Harry Co. And uh, we manufacture uh, widgets. You own 50% of the company. I own 50% of the company. And I'm married to uh, Abigail. And uh, we're in a community property state. Abigail, and depending on some some community properties, say Arizona and Washington are slightly different, but we're in the, the traditional Texas, California community property state. And Abigail uh, goes out, uh, may have a little bit too much to drink, um, uh, takes the uh, our car, uh, crashes the car, uh, kills a, a couple of people, and now she's sued for all the damages that she's caused and should be. And um, Abigail, the judgment against Abigail, also becomes a, uh, a community judgment against me. And if one of our community assets is our ownership interest in the stock in the business, and uh, guess what? All of a sudden, there is a creditor claim potentially to take those 50% of those shares of stock. And now uh, you, Darren, could wind up with a new fellow shareholder. So, um, and that could be a little difficult because they would have equal voting rights. Matter of fact, in many states, they have the right even to liquidate uh, the business. And this is a, a calamity. Um, so people will say, yeah, 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 we understand that. And, that. and that could very easily happen, especially in a community property state. So then people will say, well, we have a buy-sell agreement that, that we've put in place between Darren and Harry. And in those buy-sell agreements, as we both know, there are triggers. The triggers say, well, you know, if, if Harry dies, uh, Darren will buy out his shares and give Abigail the money. And that's one way. Harry becomes disabled and uh, then we'll buy out Harry's interest and give the money to Abigail. And there is insurance that we can necessarily buy to fund that. Uh, or we would have an installment payment plan. Uh, possibly to pay Abigail, so we, you could keep control of the business. But now, let's take a look at the same scenario that we just spoke about, where Abigail uh, crashed the car, significant injuries and or deaths, liability against Abigail uh, and Harry, and in the absence of the buy-sell agreement, or again, remember, uh, the creditor could now be your huh, your fellow shareholder, and the business, for all intents and purposes, is over. Now we have a buy-sell agreement that's in effect, and one of the provisions of the buy-sell agreement says that in the event of Harry's insolvency or bankruptcy, Darren, you'll come in and buy and buy and buy the uh, and, and buy the shares from from the creditor. So if our business is worth ten million dollars, guess what, Darren, you got a five million dollar bill that you just incurred, which is equal to fifty percent of the value of the business while you're sitting home having dinner with your wife and children. And I doubt very much that. There is, there is no insurance for that, is how, Darren, you're going to be able to make uh, that payment. You've lost your uh, key person, uh, personal guarantee. You now wind up with a liability equal to 50% of the value of the company. The financial covenants all went out of whack. And so even with a buy-sell agreement, the chances of the business surviving that um, are virtually uh, nil and none. So... 
there's a, a classic example of uh, of how that happens because a lot of people think, uh, for example, in the community property states, that everything is 50-50 uh, between spouses. It's really not. It's 100% that the collectively that whole pot of community property that exists there, and then a collective liability against that whole pot. So there's great opportunities there for asset protection in the way in which the business is structured, the way in which the marital relationship can be structured with appropriate marital agreements to preclude those uh, those problems from occurring. So again, one can withstand that type of liability and um, and settle the claim, hopefully, and be able to move on and uh, and, and, and recover uh, to, to a great degree. So, and, and there are numerous examples over and over again. So we looked at the real estate. We looked at the businesses. Um, all of our assets, our commercial buildings, all of these things all kind of orchestrate into that same or uh, a similar problem. And most of it, by the way, is um, avoidable or manageable with uh, appropriate early preemptive a- asset protection planning. Got it. Well, you, you definitely piqued my interest, and uh, I'm um, uh, always looking for ways to engage my clients and and uh, you know have some some further discussions. And because I think a lot of times, you know, people they like you said they think they've got it covered. They've got the umbrella. Uh, yeah. Most uh, most uh, misunderstood. A widely used term in insurance that oh I've got an umbrella, uh, I've got coverage, and uh, clearly there's some additional tools they need to uh, engage to make it work. Yeah, it's the combination um, of appropriate insurance and entities that make it work, right? Right, right. And speaking of uh, entities, you've mentioned uh, multiple different states and and uh, the different laws and the way uh, the, the states look at the. Uh, more of the the asset protection, or I guess the the way they treat assets. Um, I know you know it's it's common that you see a corporation in, incorporated in Nevada or Delaware or, or someplace uh, far away. Is there a a mindset, or, or is there a way that you go about uh, looking at different states, or do you you try and uh, focus on the state ones domiciled in, or? Well, well let's, 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 let's take a look at that, and that, that's a really good point, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. So, uh, first of all, I, I think that um, the uh, it's not a question of a, a corporation. Now, why why a small to medium sized business would reach outside their state of domicile to go to Nevada or Delaware um, as a corporation? Uh, it usually is not gains no benefit. There's there's no tax advantage to doing that, besides what we hear on the radio, um, and not a lot, um, if any, uh, asset protection benefit in doing that as well. Um, there are some small benefits um, in reaching to other states as a corporation, perhaps um, on, on the relationship between majority and minority shareholders, some states uh, dealing with the administration of the corporation are more favorable to majority shareholders. Some states are more favorable to minority shareholders and the standards and the duties that are involved. But unless one is having investors or a significant number of minority shareholders, usually that makes no difference. Where there is a difference is in the format of the business. See, in a corporation... Uh, I like to set a corporation on the right side, and let's set a limited liability company on the left side. And the differences fall there. In the remedies that are available to, and this is on outside in liability, to a creditor in reaching the ownership interest in the limited liability company or a corporation. In a corporation, like I said to you earlier, it doesn't matter if it's GM or Ford or Apple uh, or if it's, you know, uh, Darren Co. If it's a corporation, we have stock. Stock is able to be taken by a creditor. Stock equals managerial control. So a corporation 
does not provide the outside-in liability protection that we look for. So when we see corporations in many cases, we look and say, how can they be reorganized uh, without any adverse tax consequences in such a way as to preclude someone from taking control of a business that we've worked all our life to build? So one of the major differences is the use of a limited liability company versus a corporation. In a limited liability company, when structured properly, the sole and exclusive remedy that may be available to a creditor is the ability to place a lien over the profit distributions from the limited liability company. And so the profit distributions, if any, would be distributed to the creditor. And if structured properly, that would be the only remedy that would be available to that particular creditor. So that means they couldn't reach inside and take the assets. It means they couldn't take over managerial control, and we could never, ever lose control of our business. So the question would be, one might now be, for example, a California corporation, S corporation, and if we change that, entity to a Delaware, example, or Nevada limited liability company and authorize that to do business in the state of California, then no one would be able to take away the business on an outside in uh, liability. This is a critical difference. So when we see corporations, uh, small to medium-sized corporations, we look to see on how can we restructure them properly so that particular remedy of losing our business, which is a big one, to happen. Now, one of the things we'll hear from our brethren in the accounting field, and we hear over and over again that, hey, if you take a corporation and change it to a limited liability company, we have a lot of what we call adverse tax consequences associated with it, uh, and the tax consequences can be so adverse under federal law that that's why you need to stay a corporation because it would be the same as if you sold your company and started a new business. Well, about 15 years ago, the Internal Revenue Service adopted what we call uh, check-the-box regulations, which allows a limited liability company to be taxed as an S corporation, as a C corporation, as a partnership, or sometimes what we call a disregarded entity if it's a single-member limited liability company. Since a limited liability company can be taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation, it would be logical that if we took the C corporation or S corporation, so we had Darren Co., let's say it was an S corporation, and we changed it to Darren LLC, and we made an election to continue to tax it as an S corporation. So it's now a limited liability company, so people cannot take control of your business away from you. Yet we keep the tax status the same as it was before. This is called what we call a Plan F a reorganization, which allows corporations to become limited liability companies uh, without any adverse tax consequences and give them that modicum of asset protection, much better asset protection than they would have had as a small corporation. State by state, that's done by what we call a conversion process. And in some states, it's done by what we call a, a statutory interspecies merger, which in essence does the same thing. It's the same entity. It has now has the asset protection that it didn't have before, and it has no adverse tax consequences. And continuing costs... Uh, are about the same as they were before that uh, that change took place. It's such a significantly uh, uh, good uh, change in most cases, as long as the business is, is, for example, allowed to be a limited liability company. In some states, California being one of them, for example, for many years, a general contractor couldn't be an LLC, a law firm can't be an LLC, a doctor can't be an LLC, accountants can't be LLCs. So certain types of – a hairdresser can't be an LLC. Certain types of businesses, state by state, do not allow them to be limited liability companies just because they, uh, they could be too protective. Now, in most states today, 
Darren, uh, almost all businesses, other than the professions of law, medicine, uh, maybe perhaps architecture uh, or engineering, are allowed to be uh, limited liabilities companies and really should explore uh, that opportunity. That's one of the ways you prevent that outside-in liability from losing control of our business. You built your business all your life. You sure as heck, because somebody crashes a car or we had uh, a personal uh, judgment come from some other source, to lose your business, uh, which we didn't have to because it could have been reorganized properly, would be, uh, to me, a travesty of justice. Another thing, uh, while we're at it, you know, is uh, talking about inside-out and outside-in liabilities. On inside-out liabilities is, you know, we all sit there, many people, they form whether it be corporations or limited liability companies. We do that because we don't want to have uh, a personal liability um, for something that happened in the business. So, you know, you know little Johnny or, or, or Jill uh, crashed the car again when they went going to the post office and uh, seriously injured people. Now the business is sued. And if the business is uh, worth 200000 bucks, 300000 bucks, maybe they have inadequate uh, automobile coverage for the, for the employee that was driving, we now look at all, at least the, the, all the assets of the business may be, uh, may be finished. But we may have other assets. We may have houses and rental properties and, you know, the, the building that the business sits in that's in a separate entity and we have stocks, bonds, and cash and, and other assets. The business may represent, you know, a million dollars, but we may have $4 million worth of other assets. So if I was going to get a judgment that was in excess of the value of the business against the business, the question would be, could I reach the personal assets? And so everyone says, no, 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 no. That's why we did it. And then we hear the words, and you, we've all heard them, cocktail party talk piercing the corporate veil or piercing the veil of limited liability protection of a limited liability company. And we say, oh, well, how does that happen? Because sometimes, you know, Darren, it's not just enough that we have the entity. We've got to walk the walk and talk the talk. So here's what we see. We see people that are not having adequate books, records, minutes, shareholders meetings. These things are not options. They're mandated by the state. We see we have Uncle Benny on the health insurance, but Uncle Benny doesn't work there. We have the children on the payroll even though they really don't work there. We have the spouse that's on the payroll for the purpose of getting a 401k benefit, even though they don't work there, and the spouse is driving a company car. We've lent money to the company, borrowed money from the company without promissory notes and payments that haven't been made. We have all of these characteristics, and we're sitting there in front of a judge and saying, hey, look, you know, this is a corporation. You can't go through. You can't touch my personal assets. But we don't respect the rules and regulations of the entity, and what we have, you know, a judge may turn around and say, and very frequently sometimes do, I don't see very much of a difference between this business and you as an individual, and we're not going to allow that protection um, uh, to take place. It's like, Darren, if I came to you and said, hey, Darren, I want you to employ me. And I said, but here's the deal of my employment. I want you to put my wife on the books. I want you to pay for my wife's car. I want you to pay for my kids uh, to work there, even though they don't work there. I want you to put my Uncle Benny on the health insurance. I want to borrow money and don't have a promissory note. Darren, you turn around and say, Harry, you're crazy. This is a real business. I can't do that. But yet they do that for themselves, and that o- opens up once again another asset protection nightmare. So sometimes asset protection, Darren, is not just a limited liability company or a special trust you know, or a special marital agreement. Sometimes it's the way in which we govern ourselves in the entities that we already have that enhances and strengthens the asset protection uh, that we, we, we have. Well, let me ask you, because you, know, you bring sure. up a, a classic point of one of the – benefits of uh, business ownership is, you know, all of these um, uh, ways to absorb your personal expenses, if you will. And uh, whether or not it's uh, the right thing to do or or structured properly, I see it all the time. And one of my, if I heard you right, by doing this, if you're, if you're not following all the, the record keeping that, that are mandated or required, you've essentially... Have you invalidated or are you? No. I mean, the, the well, yes, yes, and no. It's what we call a, a facts and circumstances test. No court wants to turn around and invalidate, you know, and just automatically allow someone to pierce that veil and reach through to grab everybody else's assets. Let me give you a classic example of that, and this will kind of maybe drive it home a little bit. So let's say, Darren, uh, you and I. Uh, want to form a uh, a hamburger business, okay? 
And here's the deal. So you're going to be the operating guy, and you're going to own 25% of the stock of the company or 25% of the membership interest of the LLC. And I'm not involved. I'm just the money guy, okay? I'm, I, I'm, I'm under a, a palm tree down in, in Palm Beach, Florida. But, you know, you're my nephew, and I'm going to give you uh, $500,000 for my equity investment, and I will own 75% of the company. So the company is owned 25% Darren, who's working hard with the sweat equity, and 75% by Harry, who's sitting under a, a, a tree in Florida. Now, Harry's got several millions of dollars, and Darren, you're lucky to rub two nickels together. And, you know, I'm not there every day. You know, I'm older. I'm retired. You're there running that business every single day. It's great. But, you know, you're not following all the rules. Matter of fact, you're not doing books, records, minutes. Um, you know, you're, you're turning around and, and, you, and you put your kids, you're paying your kids, and 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 you and you started writing personal checks, you know, from from from, from the entity. And now we had a problem, and then we went to court, and we were unable. And it's when I said facts and circumstances, meaning well, well, maybe it's not just that you didn't have shareholders meetings and board of directors meetings. But we didn't have that, and we have in, inappropriate people on the payroll, and we've been borrowing money, we've been paying up personal expenses with, with corporate dollars. And now we're looking to say that that should be a protection for us, and we should have all the benefit of the law, but we don't want to follow any of the rules. It's not going to happen. And if they pierce through, it's going to pierce through to a joint and several liability to the shareholders. So not only will your personal assets go on the line, but all of my assets go on the line as well as the shareholder. And so here I am sitting under a tree in Palm Beach, Florida. I've actually had cases like this. And uh, I could be subject to a million-dollar claim because of the way you ran the business, you know, back in some other part of the country. So, yeah, it's really important that a business be run as a business and that it does the things that it only legitimately is able to do, and that all the ministerial things are done properly. Uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough, uh, because if we don't, uh, although it's not one thing that invalidates the, the asset protection, it could be cumulatively facts and circumstances depending on the case. No, that's, I tell you, that, that just opened my eyes again, just with the um, uh, exposure I think that most business owners have, and they probably don't uh, pay as much attention to as, as maybe they should. Uh, and they need just to. Making certain that those, yeah, that separation of your personal from your, your business and and uh, not just treating it like your piggy bank. Um, you know, you gotta you got to uh, follow the rules. Um, hey, we've got about uh, five minutes left here, and there was a couple sure. other things I just wanted to make sure we had plenty of time to to uh, touch on. There's something I saw, um, and it, it talked about uh, the difference between a 401k and an IRA uh, as far yeah. as protection. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming most business owners, if they're a sole practitioner or maybe just uh, um, you know don't have a, uh, employees, they may not have a 401k. They may have more of an IRA. Uh, set up. If you could talk a little bit about the protection difference between the two. Sure. Let, let me take. Uh, let me do that to cl- kind of close up our our uh, podcast together uh, on this discussion. So here's the, here's the, I guess the best way to describe that. It, it's there are what we know as uh, ERISA qualified uh, pension plans, four hundred one k's, money purchase plans, defined benefit plans, um, profit sharing plans, and an ERISA plan is protected under both every state's law and by federal law. So uh, a creditor cannot reach. Uh, O.J. Simpson had significant uh, ERISA pension plans, and even the Brown and Goldman family, even though they received got a $100 million judgment um, against O.J., couldn't reach those assets. Now, the hallmark, to make a long story very, very simple, um, is that um, it, to have an ERISA-qualified plan, we need to have at least one statutory employee who is uh, participating in that plan. So it is possible to have a 401k plan, Darren, that's just you, 
at it's called Solo K or One Person 401k plan that doesn't have a participating employee. Although it's a qualified plan, it is not an ERISA qualified plan. When we have non-ERISA qualified plans, which would be IRAs, Roths, rollover IRAs, the we no longer look at federal law for ERISA plans. We use state law to determine whether or not those plans are protected from the claims of creditors. Now, to make things more complicated, we look at it two ways. We look at it one way in a bankruptcy environment and one way in a non-bankruptcy environment. In the non-bankruptcy environment, it goes by state law. 39 states treat qualified plans that are not ERISA qualified plans, like the IRAs and the Roths, as the same as ERISA qualified plans and provide blanket protection so creditors cannot touch the retirement funds. Other states say no, and the amount that's exempt from the claims of creditors is the amount that's reasonable and necessary for the support of the debtor, which is done in a judicial determination. And then some states put an overall cap, like Nevada has a half-million-dollar cap. If we have more than a half-million-dollars in the uh, in the IRA, the amount above that could be subject to the claims of a creditor. It's particularly nasty because money that would be coming out of a qualified plan in order to satisfy a creditor claim, Darren, would be the money would go to the creditor, but the income tax liability and the penalty if you're under age 59 and a half would go to you. That is just a yeah. disastrous result. So that that now in a bankruptcy situation, a uh, million dollars per person um, uh, IRA is exempt from the claims of creditors, and any money that came from an ERISA qualified plan is exempt from the claims of creditors. So you have so you have bankruptcy, non bankruptcy non-ERISA plans and ERISA plans, the ERISA plans holding the most significant protection. But there's another side to that, and we'll kind of finish it up in the last two minutes where we have together, and that is although the creditor may not be able to reach into that plan, the question is, is can you get assets out of the plan? And that depends on a state-by-state exemption. Some states treat the money coming out of pension plan when it comes to you to be the same as wages and subject to the state's wage garnishment law. So that means we can get 25% to a creditor, 15% to a creditor, but no more than 25% under a state's wage garnishment law. Some states have no protection whatsoever, so when it comes out of the plan, it will be subject to the claims of that creditor who has a judgment. And some states say that if the plan is exempt from the claims of creditors, then the distribution from that plan is exempt from the claims of creditors. So we need to look at Again, an analysis of everybody's situation. You know, where do they stand? What states do they live in? What assets do they have? What vulnerabilities are they exposed to? And how can they best organize it? So sometimes, Darren, like I said, it had nothing to do with being ultra wealthy. It's just making sure that whatever we have is organized, structured, and protected in the best way possible. Got it. Hey, before uh, we... we, uh get closed out here real quick. I wanted to just say first of all, thank you very much Harry for for spending some time with us today. And uh also um there's a uh, there's a, a landing page if you go to the uh Blog Talk Radio link and if you go down to the bottom of the description of this uh, interview with uh, Harry, you'll find there's a link there that you can f- click on and it'll take you to a a page where you can check uh, and and uh, receive from Harry and his firm uh, an, an, a free e-newsletter, a free uh, web estate guide, and a- also a, a complimentary uh, consultation. Um, Larry, is there any, or not Larry, I'm sorry, Harry, <laughs> is there anything uh, you'd like to say quick before we uh, close here as far as... No, uh, I, I think, I think we said everything, everything we, we wanted to say, and I think that uh, anyone listening will kind of get the picture of what needs to be done. 
And if anyone would like to give us a call or request a complimentary consultation, we'd be more than happy to uh, to visit with them. Great. Well, Harry, thanks again. And uh, for the listeners, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. Uh, please look for us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.